Michelle's daughters were absolutely outraged that the police closed the case so quickly on Michelle's death. And Alexis and Rachel and Michelle's sister began their own investigation. And they spent months gathering evidence of what they felt was Martin's suspicious behavior in the days and months leading up to Michelle's death and certainly after she was found dead. And we went to the Pleasant Grove Police. We said, you know, we have this new information. We know about a girlfriend now. They took no notes. They didn't even listen. They acted like we were out of our minds. Not only would they not listen, they were mocking us. They were saying, you're ridiculous. You guys are just upset that your dad has had an affair. Lots of people have affairs. And talking with the investigator there at Pleasant Grove, they felt like this was all a natural caused kind of thing. Could they have done more? They could have. But I think the initial response was appropriate. He said, we're closing the case. Sorry. I know that's kind of shocked you because she was young to have a heart attack. You just wake up and you try to do what you can. It is living a nightmare. I try to go to the authorities. I go to the governor's office. I went to every single newspaper in Utah. I cannot understand why no one would listen. My mother was murdered, and no one cares. The fifth line down, it states that military records were brought in. It was Giselle and two adults and another kid. I went to the governor's office. I had a manila envelope with all the documents we had. The tub was only 50 inches long at the top. We don't think she can drown. Doug Whitney and Jeff Robinson were two investigators with the Utah County Prosecutor's Office. And these were two people that were assigned just to work special cases. They were put on this case to dig into it. And that's exactly what they did. Investigation is this, is Whitney. So I got information from the daughters, and I got enough to get an investigative subpoena. Doug Whitney went all the way back to Martin McNeil in college, where he began investigating everything he did and uncovered a life of lies. Martin McNeil was not who he claimed to be. If you take a pyramid and you build it with bricks and you pull those foundation bricks out, you have nothing. It crumbles. I found that the transcript used for Martin McNeil to get into medical school was totally falsified. Instead of taking his transcript and altering it, he got somebody else's. The transcript was completely fake. So this man who proclaimed loudly to anybody who would listen that he was a doctor, you're telling me wasn't? His entire career is based on falsified transcripts from different colleges. So then how did he go about practicing medicine? The guy is brilliant. I'm not saying that he's not smart. He just didn't take the necessary classes. And he lies. Martin had briefly served in the military, but had been discharged because he had claimed that he was schizophrenic and hearing voices. So he went on to collect medical disability throughout the next 30-something years, meanwhile practicing as a successful doctor and lawyer. How much money are we talking about? $3,000 a month. He was getting $3,000 a month from the Army? Yes, from the VA. Decades after he served less than two years? Decades. Investigators also discovered that when he was in his early 20s, he went to jail for check kiting. He decided to open a checking account, take the checks, and go on a shopping spree. He had rented a house, and he needed to furnish it. He also bought himself some jewelry, diamond rings, watches. He bought, like, 60 pairs of socks. 20 or 30 pairs of shoes. He bought a, a year's supply of chocolate-covered cherries. He was a convicted felon. He was charged with forgery, fraud. I remember him because he was bright and he was a con, and cons always interested me. The bottom line was, is here's a man who went to jail for 180 days, was put on parole for three years, was on felony parole when you went into medical school. It's possible to have served 180 days in prison and be on felony probation and keep that a secret from schools or employers? Apparently so. It happened. Okay, I'm gonna take a picture. Cute. 
We basically found out that our entire lives had been based and surrounded on lies. That everything about our experience with our father was a lie. You've played a part in destroying our whole family, Dad. I am the victim. I am the victim. You can't even think that that is a possibility. <laughs> Ooh. I'm the victim here. Man, if I think really hard, I can't even think of that. My logic is, I didn't commit adultery. I didn't kill your mother. I didn't have a mistress. I don't have one now. I'm planning on getting married in the temple. And I don't believe that that is a, a bad thing to do. There's that possibility, whether you want to accept it or not. I've done nothing wrong. I have done zero wrong. Alexis and Rachel started looking into what was going on and actually discovered that Martin was actually looking to have the younger children adopted by this other family to get them out of the house. He was going to give my sisters away. Yes, to adopt. He sent us all a lengthy text message saying that He's our sisters the are going to be given away. He found a family in California. He was going to foist them off on this family without the knowledge of any of his older children and without any explanation, really. He just decided to jettison every single aspect of his old life. His wife was dead, and now the young children needed to be gone. And that is when I said, there's no way you're going to do that. I'm going to fight tooth and nail. He said, if you fight me, I'm going to get you thrown out of medical school. I'm going to call your dean. He started threatening me. I'm going to take you down. I said, I'm calling the I'm police. I'm going to destroy and I'm, you. I said, there's no way you're taking my sisters. There's no way. Martin's plans for his daughter Giselle were even more sinister. Just a few months after Michelle's death, Martin decided to send Giselle back to the Ukraine for the summer for what was supposed to be a very brief trip. He sent Giselle back home to the Ukraine for just two months. But then those two months began stretching into almost a year. The rest of the family couldn't understand why Giselle didn't come home. Little did they know that McNeil and Gypsy Willis had taken Giselle's social security number and created an entirely new identity. Gypsy Willis assumed Giselle's identity. What Martin and Gypsy had planned for Giselle was almost incomprehensible. They were about to embark on a crime spree that would have made what Martin had done in his early adult years look like child's play. 